Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 
So today we're reading Bhagavad Gita chapter 9, which means the most confidential knowledge, text number 5. Prabhu, can you read the verse for me? I'll give you the microphone. You want the microphone? the purport of the word meaning word meaning word to word meaning yeah word to word meaning by his divine grace says he was good enough to come to the world of Shiva Yoga no no never never sure also also one sign one sign each way there is in me who done who done all creation all creation Pasha just Of this material manifestation, 
Sometimes we see a picture of Hitler holding the globe on his shoulder. He seems to be very tired, holding his great party banner. Such an image should not be entertained in connection with Krishna's upholding the created universe. He says that although everything is resting on me, we eat alone. The planetary systems are floating in space, and this space is the energy of the Supreme Lord. But he is different from space. His difference is situated. Therefore, the Lord says, although they are situated on my inconsiderable energy, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, I am aloof from them. This is the inconceivable opulence of the Lord. In the Nirupti Vedic Dictionary, it is said, Yuchate Nena Durga Teshu Kareshu. The Supreme Lord is performing inconceivably wonderful pastimes, displaying his energy. His person is full of different potent energies. And this determination is itself actual fact. In this way, the personality of Godhead is to be understood. We may think of doing something, but there are so many impediments, and sometimes it is not possible to do as we like. But when Krishna wants to do something, simply by his willing, everything is performed so perfectly that one cannot imagine how it is being done. The Lord explains this fact. Although He is the maintainer and sustainer of the entire material manifestation, He does not touch this material manifestation. Simply by His supreme will, everything is created, everything is sustained, and everything is maintained, and everything is annihilated. There is no difference between His mind and Himself, as there is a difference between ourselves and our present material mind, because he is absolute spirit. Simultaneously, the Lord is present in everything, yet the common man cannot understand how he is also present personally. He is different from this material manifestation, yet everything is resting on him. This is explained here as Lokam Aishwaram, the mystic power of the Supreme Person is not God. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Timanjana Suratanya Taksura Nilakyesha Tasmai Shri Purvei Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manam Vistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dajati Svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yata Padakanam Shri Guru Vaishnavascha Shri Rupam Sahrajatam Sahaganami Dhamnatam Vitam Kamsa Chaitam Sadvaitam Savadukam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Chaitam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Nitam Shri Sahanitam Sha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namaskate Tapta Kancha Gaurangi Radhe Krishnaveshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vaivacha Patitanam Pahanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadha, Shri Vasati Kaur Bhakta Vinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 
So Lord Krishna is explaining here his Yogam Aishwaram, his mystic power, mystic potency. And it's described that this potency of Lord Krishna is inconceivable. This is something which is very important for us to grasp in approaching the teachings of Lord Krishna. That we have to understand that Lord Krishna has inconceivable powers and he can perform the activities and feats which are beyond our imagination and be beyond our comprehension. Coming into Krishna consciousness, people are often bewildered. Even without coming into Krishna consciousness, people are sometimes shying away from the teachings of Lord Krishna because they consider that the, the activities and feats which are attributed to Krishna are not possible. They just think, oh, wait, it's just imagination, it's just some mythology that cannot be real. When we explain to people about the process of creation, then they're, they just think, oh, but that's ridiculous. How could it ever be like that? If we explain to them that there's a gigantic form of Lord Mahavishnu laying on the casual ocean, and from his body, the universes are coming out just like drops of perspiration are coming out from our own body. So people say, oh, come on, how could it, how is it possible? They cannot conceive that there are inconceivable powers. And when they hear about the activities of Lord Krishna, when we tell people how Lord Krishna picked up the Govardhan Hill and held up the Govardhan Hill for seven days and nights with the little finger of his left hand. And then people are like, oh God, come on, how is it possible? So people try to understand the activities of Lord Krishna with their limited mind and senses. And this will never work. You want to understand Lord Krishna. First of all, we have to understand that there are such things as inconceivable, inconceivable potency or achintya shakti, in powers which are beyond our comprehension. And this is actually something which is being made in this verse here in Bhagavad Gita, in this ninth chapter. It's confidential knowledge. To understand these things, one has to have some faith, one has to have some devotion. That's why Lord Krishna is explaining this point in the ninth chapter. Because the ninth chapter is the very heart of the Bhagavad Gita. So he wants us to understand his inconceivable powers. Srila Prabhupada gives an interesting example in the purport. He talks about the form of Atlas holding up the planet Earth. I think Prabhupada must have written that purport when he was residing in New York. Because if you go to New York, you'll see on, on the Fifth Avenue, there's one building 
called the Rockefeller Center. And outside, just in the courtyard of the Rockefeller Center, they have this very huge bronze figure of Atlas holding up the earth planet. It's from the Greek mythology. And you can see Atlas is a very muscular person, very powerful. You know, he looks like something out, out of the wrestling ring or something. Maybe he's from like Tanura or Mustika when they were fighting in Mathura, fighting Lord Krishna. They were huge and their bodies were like rocks. So Atlas, if this form of Atlas is there, and he's huge and he's much bigger, he's big, but he's picking up the earth. But it's a great labor for him. And you can see in the in the sculpture how he's laboring and how it's difficult for him to pick up the earth. But Srila Prabhupada compares Lord Krishna's activities that Lord Krishna sustaining the whole universe, not just one universe, but an infinite number of universes. And they're all in his grasp. And there's no difficulty. It's not a great endeavor for him. And of course, if he can do these things, then why can't he hold up Govardhan Hill? What is it, if you can pick up a whole universe, then it's no trouble at all to pick up a little mountain. Well, not a little. At least 5,000 years ago, in the time of Lord Krishna, Govardhan Hill was very tall, very, it's a king of mountains. But still, it was not a challenge for Lord Krishna to pick it up. So we have to understand the feats of Lord Krishna. And we see this point has already been mentioned to us earlier. In the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna has said, Janma karma cha me divya evam yogeti tattvataha tattvadi ham punar janma naiti mamiti sorry. Oh, maybe that's a, the fourth chapter, isn't it? Fourth chapter. Anyway, this is one, one of the very important verses in the Bhagavad Gita because Lord Krishna is saying we have to understand that the janma, the birth, and the karma, the activities of Lord Krishna are all divya. They're all transcendental. They're not of this material world. Our acts, our thing, whatever we're doing in this world, it's not transcendental usually. It's under the control of the material nature, the modes of nature are dictating to us and causing us to act. But Lord Krishna's activities are far above the modes of nature. Lord Krishna is performing his activities. He himself is controlling the material nature. And when we understand how Lord Krishna's activities are all transcendental, then the result is that upon giving up this body, we never have to take birth again. However, many people do hear about Lord Krishna and they have difficulty to understand. They're not able to comprehend the inconceivable powers of Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna himself is aware of that. In the Bhagavad Gita, he says, Abhajananti mam mudha manushim tanamashrita. The, the foolish mock at me, descending amongst them like a human being. They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. 
this is Lord Krishna describing to us how common people think of Lord Krishna as being a common person. They cannot understand his transcendental nature, his supreme position over everything. But he is re reaffirming that statement in the verse we're reading today. That he is, a, he is the maintainer of everything. Everything is resting on him. At the same time, he is aloof from everything. This world is part of the material nature. It's the inferior energy of the Lord. Lord Krishna has described to us how the material nature is made up of eight elements. He says, Bumer apo nalo vayu kam mano evacha ahankara iti yamme bina prakriti ashtada. Air, water, fire, air, and ether. The five elements of the material nature, gross elements, and then mind, intelligence, and ego. All together, these eight comprise my separated material nature. So, Lord Krishna used the term bina prakriti ashtada, that it bina, it's separated energy. In other words, it's not very dear to Lord Krishna. Srila Prabhupada was talking about this sloka and he gave the reference. He said, just like sometimes a man and woman, they may be married, but they may be separated. The relationship is not so close, not so intimate. So similarly, this material world, this is Lord Krishna's prakriti, but it's his separated energy. There are two kinds of prakriti. There's a superior prakriti and the inferior prakriti. The living entities are the superior prakriti. Matter, don't matter, is the inferior prakriti, apa, right? Para prakriti and apara prakriti. So this material world is the separated energy of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna himself resides in the spiritual world. He, he has his own abode in the spiritual world. He is enjoying with his eternal associates there in Vaikuntha and also in Goloka. But this material realm is also the energy of the Lord, but it's his separated energy. And Lord Krishna describes how he has created this separated energy for the enjoyment of the living entity. Apariyamitastvanyam prakriti vidime param jiva buddha mahabaho yeidam deryate jagat. Lord Krishna, after describing the eight elements of material nature, then goes on to describe the superior prakriti. He says, yet there is another nature of mind, there is another prakriti of mind which are all living entities. So all of us, different living entities, not only humans, but demigods, animals, trees, plants, all kinds of living entities. We are all the prakriti of Lord Krishna. But we are the superior prakriti because we have consciousness. The table is prakriti, but there's no consciousness there. But we are conscious beings, so therefore we're in the superior position. However, 
although we are superior, we have a problem that we think this world is for our pleasure, for our exploitation. We think that this whole material world is simply there for us to exploit. And we do a good job in trying to exploit the planet. We're doing so many things to the planet for the purpose of our own sense gratification. Of course, we get problems. And Lord Krishna goes on to describe how these problems come about. Later on in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes Mamne Vamsa Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana Manasa Stani Indriyani Prakriti Stani Karshati. Lord Krishna is describing that all the living entities are all his parts and parcels. Mami Vamsa Jiva Loke Jiva Buddha Sanatana. We're eternally part and parcel with the Supreme Lord. Meaning, we're not the Lord, but we are tiny parts of the Lord. The relationship is like that between the fire and the spark. We as living entities are tiny in comparison to the Lord. He is infinite, and we are infinitesimal. We're very small. Like the spark comes from the fire. Or like the drop of water from the ocean. One in quality, different in quantity. That is the connection which we have with the Lord. The relationship is like that. But, Mami Vamsa Jiva Loki Jiva Bhutta Sanat Manashastani Indriyani Prakriti Stani Kashi. We are struggling very hard with the six senses. We're struggling with the mind. The mind is the sixth sense. We're struggling. Why? We're struggling with the Prakriti the material nature because we're trying to exploit it. We're trying to in take it independently of the Supreme Lord. And this is why we meet with problems. Karshati. Troubles come. Because we are trying to exploit the resources of the world. We're thinking everything for us, for my enjoyment. So, Lord Krishna comes to speak Bhagavad Gita to explain to us his supreme position. As he is doing in the verse tonight, we are hearing that he is actually above everything. That it's all his energy and he is in control of everything and he controls it just by his will. Wouldn't we also like to be like that? You do everything just by your will. That is the position of the Supreme Lord. Of course, we would all love, oh, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Just by my will, I can do anything. This is God, you see. This is his supreme position. He simply thinks about something and it all happens, it all comes about at the time of creation. The, the Lord orders, now there will be creation. Immediately it happens. Brahma begins to create. And when the Lord orders, now is the time for annihilation. Lord Shiva will destroy everything. Just simply by the will of Lord Krishna, everything happens. When there was a forest fire in Vrindavan, because Vrindavan, forest land, a lot of bamboo, and some 
very dry in the summer, very, very dry. So a little friction between the bamboo will produce some sparks and the fire will come. So sometimes Lord Krishna would be there in the forest and there would be a forest fire. And they would all, all the people of Vrindavan, all the cowherd boys, they, all, they would all come to Krishna. Oh Krishna, save us. The people of Vrindavan don't think of anyone else but Lord Krishna. And when the danger comes, they immediately turn to Krishna. And Krishna immediately reciprocates. He sees there's some danger to his dear devotees. And Lord Krishna tells them all, just close your eyes. And Krishna swallows the whole forest fire. And everyone is saved. This is the glorious position of Lord Krishna. That he can do these inconceivable feats. Another example of Lord Krishna's inconceivable potency was after he had gone to the ashram of Sandipani Muni. Now, what happened was Lord Krishna came from Vrindavan to Mathura, took part in the wrestling match, and then killed Kamsa. And after the death of Kamsa, then he could release his mother and father Vasudeva and Devaki from the prison house of Kamsa. So Vasudeva and Devaki had been in prison for a long time and Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram had been in Gokul, they'd been in the home of Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda. So Vasudeva and Devaki wanted to send their children for education. Just like today, you know, your child grows up, you send them to school. You don't let them just stay at home. Your, your child may say, oh, mama, I just want to stay home. I don't want to go to school. But mother will say, no, 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 you have to go. And so this Lord Krishna and Lord Balara, they were sent to Sandipani Muni's ashram. It's in Ujjain. We have our Iskon temple there in Ujjain today by the grace, by the hard efforts of His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj. He built a beautiful temple there. And it's a holy place. Originally, Ujjain was known as Avantipur. So, Sandipani Muni's ashram was there in Avantipur, and Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram went there to study. And they studied, they stayed there for 64 days. There were 64 different arts which they had to learn, and they spent one day for each art, and they mastered everything to perfection. And after 64 days, they had completed their study. So then Sandipan, they were, they were thankful to Sandipani Muni. Sandipani Muni then requested them that I have taught you everything. He said, now you should give me some Guru Daksha. So Sandipani Muni understood the nature of his students. So when he asked for Daksha, he didn't just say, give me some Singapore dollars. You know, he said, some time back, my son died when he was at the sea. He said, please bring him back from death for me. That's an interesting dakshin, isn't it? You know, if, if you're Guru Maharaj, <laughs> if you request your Guru like that. Or you request, you, the guru may request the students, right? Not, not you request your guru. The guru requests the students. <laughs> Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram came as students. And Sandipani Muni requested them. My son died. 
you should repay me, give me Guru Dakshin, bring back my dead son. Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram immediately said, no problem. <laughs> and Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram then went. They went, first of all, they went to the sea and they, they because they heard there was a demon residing in the sea and the demon was supposed to have been responsible for the death of Sandy Panimoni's son. So that demon was actually Sankachuta. And, uh, was it not Sankachuta? Anyway, uh, it, it, he was in the form of a conscia. And Lord Krishna went there and found the demon, killed him, and brought the conch up, but couldn't find the son of Sandipani Muni there. So then Lord Krishna went with Lord Balaram, they went to see Yamaraj. They went to the abode of Yamaraj. And when they got to the abode of Yamaraj, Lord Yamaraj came and immediately offered them respects, understanding their identity, that they were the personalities of Godhead. And he requested them, how can I serve you? What can I do for you? We hope if we have to go to Yamaraj, <laughs> he will also ask us. <laughs> anyway, we hope we don't have to go to Yamaraj. But Lord Krishna went there, and they told Yamaraj that some time back my son died and this my, my guru's son died in the sea. You please do you have him here? You please give him to us. Immediately Yamaraj brought the son of the guru, Sandi Paniman, and presented him to Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram. And in this way Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram brought back the dead son of their guru and gave him the Sandipani Muni. The Sandipani Muni was very happy, very pleased with them, and he blessed them. He gave them a very nice blessing. He blessed them that their glories will always be known, and everything they learned, all the mantras they've learned, will remain fresh in their memory. So we hope also everything you learn here, you'll remember, will remain fresh in your mind. Right? Krishna consciousness. So we want to understand the inconceivable potency of Lord Krishna. How he could perform these amazing... This, this is not just some fairy tale. We're thinking, sometimes people think, oh, come on, how do we know this is true? Well, look at the other things which you believe. Scientists present so many bogus theories about the origin of life. We hear, for example, how did the world come about? Oh, everything came from the black hole. Do we see any black holes where the, the universes are coming out? Sometimes, sometimes the theories which are presented by so-called scientists are most unscientific. But the mass of people follow them. And another example is uh, Darwin's theory. As Srila Prabhupada points out, it was simply a theory. There was never any real proof of evolution, that life evolved, human life has evolved from the apes. We don't see any apes becoming humans. So it's simply a theory with no proof, no substantial proof, no evidence. We are presenting the evidence of scriptures. Vedic scriptures, which for time immemorial have, pre have presented the most wonderful knowledge for our benefit. 
the Krishna Consciousness Movement is in dedicated to publishing, printing, and distributing these kind of books to let people know about these things. There's so many things we need to learn, which we don't learn usually in the course of a normal education. We spend a lot of money and a lot of time pursuing mundane knowledge to get education. It doesn't do us any good. It may help us get a job, earn an income, maintain our life, but it doesn't give us any real knowledge about the truth of life. We want to understand the truth of life. We have to read scriptures. We have to hear from the real authority. So Vedic scriptures, they are Aparusha. The original Vedas are not written by any person. And the Vedas, it is said, Tenhe Brahma Hridaya Adhikavriye Muyantiya Suraya. The, the Vedic knowledge was imparted into the heart of Brahma at the time of creation. So that same Vedic knowledge is being passed on today with the help of people like Srila Vyasadeva, the incarnation of the Lord, literary, the person who is responsible for writing all the supplements to the Vedas, the Puranas, and particularly the Srimad Bhagavatam. And of course, we have also to thank him for the Mahabharata, where the Bhagavad Gita comes from. So we want to get truth, we want to get knowledge, we want education. You can get it from scriptures, reading scriptures like Ramayana, Mahabharata, ba Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita particularly contain real transcendental knowledge. So Lord Krishna is teaching all of us the importance of hearing from scriptures. And Lord Krishna would even quote scriptures in the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes that he's discussing with Arjuna whether the absolute truth is a dvaita or dvaita, whether it's one or two. And Lord Krishna said, this is explained in Brahma Sutra. And Brahma Sutras mean Vedanta Sutra. So Lord Krishna himself familiar with all the scriptures. He says in the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Vedanta Krit Vedavid Eva Chaham. By all the Vedas I am to be known. Indeed, I am the author and I am the compiler of the Vedas. So Lord Krishna in his form of Vaipayana Vyas, he has compiled the Vedic scriptures presented them for our benefit. We have to take advantage to hear these things, to read these books. Nowadays, people don't read much books. They read their handphones. Right? If everyone has a hand mobile phone, and we use our mobile phones for reading. So you can get a soft copy of Bhagavad Gita. Keep the scriptures in your phone. That's a good use of your phone. Using everything in the service of Krishna. We're not against technology if you can use it in Krishna consciousness. And certainly we can use uh, mobile phones in the, con in the service of Krishna to read Bhagavad Gita, to learn slokas, to chant the verses, to chant prayers. This is very nice activity. All right, we'll stop here. We'll ask if there's any questions.
or any comment or anything? Of course, I'm in Singapore. I don't usually get a lot of questions here. <laughs> I should know that. Hmm. <laughs> yes, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. <laughs> mm, yes, uh, it, it, it's a, our own mind which is thinking this is urgent. Within the mind, you know, something like office work or something, we would think is yes, very important, or very urgent, and that can deviate us from our own sadhana. You may be doing some spiritual practice, as you said, some chanting, or maybe we're doing even puja or something. And then you suddenly think that, oh, I have some other thing to do which is more important. The mind has that nature that it will certainly try to deviate us, take us away from one thing to another. We're constantly battling with the mind. And Arjuna also found it very difficult as he told Lord Krishna. Because Lord Krishna had told him in the chapter 6 of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna is explaining to him about doing meditation, doing asanga yoga, and controlling the mind. But Arjuna said, Chanchalahi mana Krishna. That my mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, more difficult to control than the wind. That was Arjuna. Prabhupada said Arjuna was a, a Maharati, born in a royal family, a great personality. And even he had difficulty to control the mind. So what to speak of our own self? Certainly it's difficult. But however, we see Lord Krishna, he doesn't say, well, okay, you know, all right, I understand it's the mind. Rather, Lord Krishna says, no, he said, you have to practice. Lord Krishna said, I know it's difficult, but if you practice, Abhyasena to Kuntia Vairagena Chagriya. By constant practice and detachment, then you can succeed. We have to be a little determined in practice of our sadhana. And there will always be things which come up which may deviate us, and the, the mind gets carried away. And then later on you realize, oh, that really wasn't so urgent, it really wasn't so important, and I stopped my chanting, I could have been chanting, I could have finished my japa, instead now I have to go chant 
all night or something. And so we have to constantly check the mind before you make decisions. And certainly we want to be cautious any decision which is going to take us away from the service of Krishna. When you're actually engaged in doing some devotional work, you want to complete it. You don't want to just stop somewhere and go off to do something else. Therefore, sadhana is very important. You have to be regulated. You have to have some kind of standard program that at a certain time I'm going to do my japa just like we have in, a, in our ashrams. If you're in the ashram, wake up at a certain time, everyone will wake up maybe 3.30 or something, everyone's up. And then Mongol Arti, 4.30. After Mongol Arti, then japa. And then Guru Puja, and, you know, we have a very regulated morning program. And that morning program will last maybe four hours. And so we, you know, we, we try to give that period of time every day for our spiritual practice. And that's what gives us the strength to keep ourselves Krishna conscious in the course of the daytime. You have things to do, all right, you have a job, you're working, that's understandable. Yes, you have to work, you have to maintain yourself, you need some income, but you don't want to sacrifice your spiritual life also just for the sake of your work. As you said, you do some, it's not really so urgent, but the mind says, Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead, do it. The mind takes us away from Krishna. So the mind can be the friend and the mind can be the enemy. How are we going to use it? If the mind is telling you to surrender to Krishna, then it, that's good. That's a good. But if the mind is telling you, you don't need to do this, go back, go do the work, do you? Do you then you have to question, is my mind working properly? Is it giving me good information? We cannot just simply take information from the mind. We have to control the mind. So Bhagavad Gita says, the mind is superior to the senses, but higher than the mind is intelligence. So we need to get that intelligence to control the mind. And that intelligence comes, intelligence is seated next to the soul, next to the Paramatma, the Lord in the heart. As Lord Krishna said, from me comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. So Lord Krishna knows everyone's desire. Do we want to remember or do we want to forget? It's giving the super soul is sometimes often speaking to us, telling the intelligence, stop him, don't let him do this. But the mind, the, is the mind listening? Well, the intelligence is there to arrest the mind. The intelligence is higher than the mind. So we use our, of course, sometimes it happens, of course, that we don't listen to the intelligence. And the mind just acts. We give the, we compare the senses to the horses on a chariot. The mind is like the reins on the chariot. And the driver of the chariot is the intelligence. You need a good driver. If you have the good driver, then he can use the reins, he can control the horses. So we have, we have to have that strong intelligence. Where do we get that intelligence from? 
Well, we get that intelligence from, it can come from the heart, from the Paramatma, the Lord in the heart. It can also come from the, the spiritual teacher, from the sadhus and from the scriptures. Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. These things, they can help you to get the intelligence to make proper decisions. Decision making is a, is a big subject matter. How to make the right decision. So we have to have that direction from Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. Then you can make proper decisions. Proper use of intelligence. Don't just depend on the mind. So whimsical activities, you're just hearing the mind. We're not listening to any intelligence. So we have to guard against that. If we have that, some, if we have that nature, just to, to be rash, impulsive, to do things without thinking, that's not the way. Arjuna didn't do that. In the Bhagavad Gita, we see Arjuna putting his case towards Lord Krishna. It, I, I'm bewildered. I don't know what I should do. Arjuna was not impulsive. He didn't just go away from the battlefield, but he, he questioned Lord Krishna. What should I do? Please, I am your disciple, a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct. Why? Because, because I'm confused. I'm confused about my duty. So in our everyday life, we will often be confused. What to do? We need to take help from Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is here in the form of the scripture, Bhagavad Gita, is speaking to us. Lord Krishna is also speaking to us from the heart. If we hear him. Are we willing to hear from the heart? Thank you for that. Thank you, Madam. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 So I have a similar question that uh, when we are doing the sadhana in every day, so now we are told about you know, like waking up and doing the chanting, sounds of chanting. So what we are chanting, you know, we are uh, almost about controlling the sleep, you know. So can you maybe tell some practical tricks where maybe if you wake up at four, we still keep the energy through the day, still be still be sleeping. Maybe because we wake up very early. And we start getting sleepy maybe by afternoon, you know, sometimes. So, is there, are there any practical tricks, you know, which, which can help us? Like, Arjuna is one thing about Buddha says, like, you know, he, 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 he practiced, you know, to control his sleep to such an extent that he could, you know, you know sleep that he could serve the Lord. So, you know, how do we, how do we get to that level you know, where we practice with less sleep, we create energetic results? <laughs> Let's sleep. Yes, Srila Prabhupada said when he was a young man, he gave up mating and defending. And then he said, now in my old age, I have also had to give up eating and sleeping. So giving up sleep or reducing sleep. Uh, we, we want to be cautious about that. You don't want to go to extremes. Because Lord Krishna also points out that a yogi is one who does not eat too much or eat too little. And he also does not sleep too much or sleep too little. So you have to sleep. You have to get some rest. The, how much rest do you need? that will depend on the individual. Now sometimes 
we will be able to work harder and put more, do, have put more energy into our serve and to our activities. And sometimes there will be less activities, less things to do, and we may find ourselves having more time to sleep. So it, the situation varies. Some people have to eat more and other people can eat less. And similarly with sleeping, some people sleep more, some people sleep less. I met one person, they couldn't, they hadn't slept for several years. She wasn't, the, the one woman came to, and I was in Hong Kong, and the lady was saying, for several years she hasn't been able to sleep. So that's not a very healthy condition. Somehow she was surviving. So sleep, yes, Lord Chaitanya also decided we should have kirtan every night. At the home of Srivas Thakur, Lord Chaitanya said, why should we spend nights sleeping? Every night we will meet and have kirtan, the whole night. And the devotees came, and every night they had kirtan. Wouldn't you like that? Have kirtan every night, 20, yeah, the whole night, kirtan. I don't know what the neighbors would say. <laughs> But anyway, so sleeping, yes, sleeping is like death. We don't like to sleep too much, but you have to get some rest. Usually the body requires it. Now, if there's more work, more activities, more engagement, we'll find we can work quite hard. We can do quite a lot of work. But when there's less involvement, then people do less work. Hmm. Pramalochan Prabhu was telling me how during the lockdown, you know, they had the policy, everybody stay at home and work at home. But after they found out people not working very much at home, you know, the work is less and less. <laughs> okay, everybody come back to work. Don't stay at home anymore. So, how much people work depends on the, the, the pressure which is put on them, the, the, the need for work. And similarly, sleep is like that. If, if there's not a lot of need for sleep, often we can minimize, we can reduce the sleep. You may have, for example, on Janmastami, when we celebrate Janmastami, now, Janmastami will go up to midnight. In fact, it will be after midnight. Because at midnight we have the RT, and then after RT, then distribute prasadam. And by the time you put everything, it's going to be two o'clock in the morning. And then, and then Mongol RT is 4.30. So you don't get much rest on the time of Janmastami. You're getting ready the next the next day, of course, after Janmastami, is Srila Prabhupada's we ask the puja. It's a very important day. And you definitely don't want to miss Mongol Arti on Prabhupada's we ask the puja day. Do you? <laughs> so Somehow, devotees manage it. We, we manage to minimize our sleep. When, the, the, when there's a need, you can often do it. Um, I remember years ago, we would have always Christmas marathon. We would go on book distribution, Sankirtan, during the month of December. And we would be out all day distributing books and we we stay out late in the night come back late at night and next morning again go out again and be out there the whole day and you know how how did we do it i don't know how somehow we just did it you know everybody just everyone's doing it if everyone does it <laughs> you don't think about it so if everyone decides we're going to sleep less you could do it 
But if everybody's sleeping and you're not, you know, well, I also want to sleep. Again, it's the mind. What we think we need, we, we don't always need. But anyway, Prabhupada recommends sleep. He said, most people, they need six, six hours sleep. Six hours, he said, should be enough. Some people may need longer. And some people can do with less. And some people, they have a custom every year, reduce their sleeping. Reduce their sleeping 10 minutes or 15 minutes every year, you know. And then as the years go on, <laughs> you don't sleep very much. And certainly Srila Prabhupada didn't sleep very much. He would take a few hours rest and then wake up and do his translation. And similarly, the Goswamis, the Goswamis of Vrindavan, they didn't sleep much. They were liberated souls. So they conquered eating and sleeping. And they were always meek and humble. And they were engaged in the transcendental loving service of Radha and Krishna. So the more you're absorbed in Krishna consciousness, then the less the inclination will be there to sleep. But we, it, again, it's just controlling the mind. The mind thinks, oh, I didn't sleep very much, I should sleep more. We don't actually need to sleep. We can minimize these things, we can regulate them. Okay? Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, we've come to the end of Maharaj's lecture today. Before we end our program, 